guest speaker tonight is Dr. Nicholas Galeski from UC San Diego, um, and he works on cosmic microwave background measurements from the Simon Observatory in South America, uh, Small Aperture Telescope. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Nick. All right, thank you for the introduction and hand it over. And there we go. Uh, that coming through okay? Good, get some nods there. All right. Um, yeah, no, thank you for the, that video. That sets it up quite nicely. Um, yeah, to his, uh, now you all know, now you are all experts on inflation. And uh, so I can go on and tell you exactly how we're going to try and observe that. Um, or at least some of the details there. Uh, and since I know there's a lot of people in this group who love their telescopes, um, I'm gonna say I love telescopes as well. I like designing and building them. And so uh, while that was, that was a great introduction for the science case, it made my job easier because now I can focus on kind of the, the fun technical details of uh, how we actually go about trying to see the first 10 to negative 31st uh, seconds after uh, the beginning of the universe. Uh, which is what we try to do. Um, first up, I want to start with this title slide here. Let me get my pointer up and running. There we go, laser pointer. All right, um, I want you to think about these two objects here, this guy on the right, and these three things on the left, uh, because these are the telescopes we are designing and building right now uh, for the Simons Observatory in uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, this one is the what we call the Large Aperture Telescope, the LAT. And uh, it's large, it's six meter uh, aperture dish. So that's a pretty big telescope. These are stairs here. Um, and then these over here are what I predominantly work on, uh, although I've worked a bit on both. Uh, and these are the small aperture telescopes, uh, small aperture by our size, uh, they're half meter aperture telescopes. And we actually are building an array of them. And really what I want you to think about here is, you know, do these look like a, what you would expect a telescope to look like? How are they different than telescopes you're used to? Um, you know, what kind of features about them can you look at and see, ah, I can see what that does, and what features are you, uh, you know, have some more questions about. Uh, and my hope is with my talk, I'll be kind of explaining how we got here, how we got to uh, these kind of odd looking telescopes, and just generally why telescopes in this part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, the microwave, the millimeter, uh, why they look like they do and give some insight for hopefully, hopefully uh, if you see these in the news, um, hopefully we'll be making newsworthy discoveries in not too long. Uh, you'll know a little bit of background about how we made them. Um, so yeah, so with that great introduction, I can really build off of uh, basically another picture of exactly what he was talking about. Uh, where we're here, uh, this is where we're observing from. Uh, of course, light takes a finite time to travel, so the farther we look away, the farther back in time we look. And so this is a little diagram that basically shows the history of the universe, uh, just as you saw in the video, where up here we have galaxies that are formed and you have formation of structure and galaxies over this whole period, uh, with the first stars about 400 million years after the Big Bang. Um, and if you go far enough back, you start seeing this surface, that, uh, as he mentioned, is referred to as the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. Uh, and what's important to remember is, of course, we see this in whatever direction we're looking at, right? So you can imagine this whole thing wrapping around us here on the present day. And no matter which direction you look, this is what you're going to see. Um, and really what I want to convey a little bit here is why we are so excited to be looking at it. And hopefully the video got you excited, but just to, to build off of that, by looking at this, the, you know, the oldest light we can look at in the universe, the farthest back we can look, because before that, before the CMB, the universe was opaque. Light uh, photons could not travel out and reach us. So we had to wait for the universe to expand enough and cool enough and allow those photons to travel through the universe to us here. Um, that means that this surface, the light there, is basically the best probe of the early universe. To understand how our universe was made, how it came to be in the very earliest instances, how it evolved, and the, the basic physics that underlies all of the structure in the universe. 
uh, all of that information is contained within the patterns that we can observe at the cosmic microwave background by teasing out little small signals, little small fluctuations, um, we have already come leaps and bounds in understanding how our universe formed and evolved in the earliest uh, stages. And there's still quite a bit we can do uh, to understand even further, um, gain more understanding past that. And one of the things he actually alluded to, which I was going to gloss over because it's a little hard to explain, but with that video, uh, we're set. Uh, is inflation and this earliest uh, fractions of a second after the Big Bang, this exponential expansion that is the dominant theory. It's not the only theory we have of what happened, um, but it's the dominant one because it matches up with most of the observations we have from the CMB. And there is a predicted pattern it would leave on the CMB light that we might be able to observe. And these telescopes that are behind me in each of my ears uh, and that I'll be showing you more of, are, we are designing them specifically to go after that signal, to understand the earliest fractions of a second of our universe. So that's what's really exciting about it, um, and that you know people have been going after this for some years now, uh, and I think we have a really good chance of getting down to the, the basically the sensitivities, the, the raw uh, understanding of the, these tiny fluctuations. Uh, we have a chance to get there with the Simons Observatory. Um, to give a little bit more background about what, you know, kind of a little more context to the CMB. Um, when that light scattered from that surface, it was actually quite hot. It was almost like the surface of the sun, thousands of Kelvin, quite hot. Um, but because the universe has been expanding ever since then, um, it has cooled down those photons that reached us. So we actually speak in temperature units. And when we look at the temperature of the CMB, we say it's 2.7 Kelvin about, and that's really cold. It's about you know, 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, and what that means, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but what that means is the all, pretty much the peak of the light from the CMB is in the microwave, in millimeter scale wavelengths, so much longer. And this is kind of between radio uh, and the far infrared is kind of where we live. And if you were able to have microwave eyes and look at the sky, it would be incredibly uniform. The CMB is this temperature across the sky to very small amounts. And, and I should point out that even just discovering this temperature was a huge deal. Again, that was kind of in the video that it threw out a bunch of other theories about what could have happened uh, in the early universe. Um, but these days, the absolute temperature doesn't tell us as much. So what we tend to look at is the fluctuations. And sure enough, that's the pattern you saw on the last one, is this isn't an actual, um, this isn't an absolute measure, this is really fluctuations from that temperature. So plus or minus, in this case, 300 microkelvin. Um, but what you can think of is we're trying to measure the temperature of the sky from the early universe uh, with about one part in 10,000 is this graph between uh, one part of the sky and another part of the sky. And we're actually going after a signal that's much smaller than that because this is, you know, this is already a great map from the Planck satellite. We need to improve on that if we're going to get funded. So we're actually looking at signals that are closer to one part in a million or less. These incredibly small fluctuations in the temperature of the CMB. And that's what can tell us about what happened in the earliest parts of the universe. Uh, I should say this is our uh, this is our telescope array, the Simons array, actually a predecessor of Simons Observatory, that is uh, actively up and running in Chile. Or parts of it are. Okay, so to give one more bit of context, they actually showed this image, and I love it too. So I'm going to show it. Um, and the key thing I want you to think about is to remember that we're at the very center of this. And no matter where you look out, you'll, uh, if you're able to see fluctuations in the millimeter spectrum, you'd be able to see these small temperature fluctuations. The other cool thing about this image is this is the entire observable universe. We are inside of there, and the only things we can see are inside of there. Okay, and that's just our section of the universe that we are able to see and sample and use to understand how the physics of the universe actually works. Um, so that's a really cool graphic gives a little bit of context. To give a little more historical context to what we're doing, uh, and he said, I think that, that we've been at this for about 50 years, and that's about right. There was an accidental discovery in New Jersey with the Holmdel Horn uh, in 1965, uh, thereabouts. 
And since then, that kind of revolutionized cosmology at the time over the next, say, 20, 30 years, uh, and prompted three satellites in succession, COBE, WMAP, and most recently, Planck, all of which have drastically improved our understanding of the universe. Uh, in uh, kind of partnership with those, because those have effectively lag in both technology and uh, resolution, just the constraints of satellite missions, uh, have been complemented by a number of other observatories, including a bunch of balloon-borne observatories that were launched uh, that made some major discoveries. And you can think of them as you know satellites on a, uh, on a budget, very small budget, but they can go after very focused discoveries and have been successful at that. And then a whole series of ground-based observatories, which is where a lot of the future lies, because there's a, quite a bit of science we can do uh, beyond that inflationary science uh, with a larger mirror. And so you see, uh, this is South Pole Telescope in Antarctica. That's a 10-meter dish. You have the uh, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, six-meter dish. I just showed you the uh, Simon's Array or Polar Bear, which are two and a half-meter dishes. So there's this whole array of telescopes that have been going after this with the um, ground-based ones really coming into their own recently with uh, big strides that have been made in terms of technology. All right, so what I want to get to is how do we actually design these? How did we end up with these telescopes behind me? Um, keeping in mind that we're ultimately driven and you know, a slave to the science, right? Ultimately, we want to get those science discoveries, and we need to make discoveries that are novel, that improve upon what has already been made. Um, and so that really drives our design. And I'm going to gloss over that whole process, which is this huge iterative fun process where we go back and say, this is the science we like to do, and then we see if it fits in our budget. Uh, and if it doesn't, how we can modify it to maximize the returns given uh, the resources we have. Uh, so that's kind of this big process uh, that's encapsulated in I would say summaries of the Simons Observatory science case, or um, there's, we wrote a large paper on it, which is also fantastic, though a little dense. Um, but let's get into, let's pretend we've done that process and said we've, we've agreed that we can make this instrument. Um, and what are its kind of basic requirements that we have to meet on the kind of technical side? So the first of which is just going to be your basic telescope parameter, your aperture. How big does it need to be to get the resolution and sensitivity that we need to make our discoveries? Uh, so the first thing we're looking at is we, we need a six meter dish. We need something big. That makes That's one of the things that the ground-based telescopes are very competitive on. Um, that goes after small scales. Now, when I say small scales, they're small in the microwave. So two arc minute is uh, the resolution of a six meter microwave dish, thereabouts. Um, <clears throat> and I'm showing here a nice picture of M1, the Crab Nebula, with the resolution of what I call the large after telescope here. And you can already see that, you know, kind of this is as good as we can resolve things. So uh, we can look at the Crab Nebula. We do. It's a calibration source for us. Uh, it would turn out to be quite blurry. But there's another thing that's kind of interesting is, is these small scales are really interesting across huge parts of the sky. And so with this dish, we want to look at about 50% of the entire sky. It's a huge survey. We cover half of the, the sky that, you know, of all the sky, you know. Um, so it's this huge survey instrument, but that means it lacks a bit in depth. And to go over that inflationary signal, that really hard, faint signal, you really need depth. And so you just want to focus on a small section of the sky with as much power as you want. And to really find that inflationary signal, we're lucky. You don't need good resolution. In fact, you can do it with a half meter dish. So this is uh, basically the aperture for the small aperture telescopes, uh, where at half meter, we only um, are able to look at things a, a resolution of 20 arc minutes. Uh, and so we actually do look at the Crab Nebula still, but for us, it's a point source. We're only able to you know, identify it as a single bright blob. Um, but again, that's, that's a sacrifice, a trade-off we make to get the depth uh, to make this particular instrument incredibly sensitive. Uh, so right away, I'm telling you, we have these two instruments. They go after slightly different science targets, and they're tuned uh, for those science targets. We need to keep that in mind. The other more general science targets to keep in mind is it's a, uh, a 2.7 Kelvin black body. That's what the CMB is. This is one of the original maps. Um, and that's, that's cold. It, it doesn't release um, a lot of power. So it's a fairly faint source, especially con uh, compared to everything else around us. Uh, so that makes some challenges to actually get, you know, a good signal uh, from the CMB. And on top of that, we really want the sensitivity 
you know, I showed you this map, this is one part in 10,000, but we need to do better than one part in a million, just on the variations on here. So that's a huge challenge uh, as far as the instrument goes. And then kind of added on top of that, what we've learned from previous generations of experiments is we can't just focus on a one wavelength of light. We don't need a huge amount of spectral information, but we do need some spectral information. And it's actually fairly impressive if you think about it. We need to observe between one millimeter and 10 millimeters. That's an order of magnitude in terms of the wavelength. So, you know, I'm trying to think of a good analogy for optical. I think that would be like 100, uh, 100 nanometers to say 1,000 nanometers, which would be the UVs, the near infrared. Uh, it's a quite wide frequency or wavelength regime that we need to look at. So that adds a lot of technical challenge to our instrument as well. Okay, with that being said, with these kind of lists in your mind about what we need to hit, um, let's go into actually designing the telescope. And literally what we do when we start is we say, what's on the table? Oh, everything's on the table. So you, know, you have your two broad classes, your refractive uh, telescopes with lenses, uh, say two lens system here to focus, and a reflective system, a Gregorian telescope here uh, that brings it to a focus, right? And just to remind you kind of what those systems look like, this is what you'd be used to seeing. A little smaller aperture, but you have a refractive telescope on the left and a reflective one on the right. Um, okay, so right away we can kind of go through our list and see if these meet them. Uh, reflective is pretty good all around um, because it's uh, pretty good optical quality and so on and so forth. Uh, immediately with the refractive, you come across a few issues. First off is lenses. Uh, lenses, even in the technology we use in the microwave, uh, have chromatic aberrations. They don't refract the wavelength of light the same uh, depending on the wavelength. So you would get a blurred focus across our, as I mentioned, fairly large wavelength regime. Uh, so that might not work, except I can cheat a little bit. I can say, well, I can't do all of those wavelengths in one telescope, but I could have several of them. So this is still on the table, but only if we build several of them to cover all those different wavelengths. Um, the second issue I have with lenses is, have you ever heard of anyone making a six meter wide lens? I haven't, and I don't want to. It sounds terrifying. Uh, so we, we definitely don't want that for the large aperture, but our small aperture, a half meter, can I make a lens that's about a half meter on size? And the answer is yes, with the technology we have, um, that is something I can do. So, okay, so neither of these is ruled out, but there are some challenges. So let's get to the first challenge. The floor is lava. A little bit of exaggeration, but let's, uh, let's get into what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about and what I uh, often come across in these lectures is uh, uh, talking about black bodies, and it's something I deal with every single day and that we deal with a lot in our telescopes. Uh, and the idea of a black body is a theoretically, you know, ideal radiator and absorber of energy at all wavelengths. So a good example of this would be a charcoal briquette. It's black. Anything that's black is, you know, some level of black body, maybe not perfect, but approaching. It's very good at absorbing light. And if you were to look at the, you know, like far infrared or whatever temperature it's at, it would actually be glowing quite hot. It would also be radiating light. Uh, and you can think of that, if you heat it up, it will radiate light. In the near infrared, you, you can start actually seeing it. You can start seeing it glowing red as you increase the temperature. Um, and that's true of, say, the old style of light bulbs. Uh, if you heat up a filament like that, hot enough, it'll get about the same spectral response as the sun. Um, so so this is just to say that pretty much everything is some level of black body permission of light, um, including the CMB and uh, including most of the things around us. So looking at some more examples of that, uh, a obvious one is the sun. It's about 5,000 Kelvin. It emits as a black body at invisible wavelengths. Okay, great. Um, let's go a little bit cooler. Let's go humans. Here I am. <laughs> there we go. The beard. Uh, and you can see that humans, we're about 300 Kelvin or thereabout, we emit really brightly in the infrared. If you have an infrared camera, you can go check this out. Beer is a little colder. It emits at a lower wavelength. Um, and then, to make life really difficult, we go to the CMB. The CMB is extremely cold, 3 Kelvin, just above absolute zero. If you like Fahrenheit, it's negative 451. Um, and that means it's longer wavelengths, microwave wavelengths. Okay. So now you have something that says humans or the room around us emit light at infrared. 
And the CMB, the thing we want to look at is emitting light and the microwave. Uh, so this kind of starts getting into the problem we have. And there's this wonderful thought experiment a former uh, advisor of mine came up with, which is, uh, say I were to blindfold you, and I told you to go outside and find the sun blindfolded. Could you? Well, yeah. You just hold up your hand, right? You, you can find the hot part of the sky uh, with, your, with your eyes closed or blindfolded, right? Um, that's just to say that the sun is a lot hotter in your hand, and it's a lot hotter than anything else in the sky. Uh, and so you're able to tell where the most photons, where the most energy is in the sky pretty easily. Okay, what if I were to tell you to do the same thing, but with the moon? The moon's hotter than the sky, um, but the problem is your hand's hotter than it, and it's uh, generally you just get a lot of noise. It's not a very good detector for something that, um, that cold. However, if you do a fun trick, you can dip your hand in liquid nitrogen, and then it would be colder than the moon. And if you could feel sensation still after that, uh, you would be able to find the moon in the sky. Do, uh, obviously, don't try that at home. Okay, so this kind of gives you an already clue of where I'm going with how we build our telescopes, which is uh, if you have this really faint signal from something cold, like the CMB, and you have all these other hot things around it, the floor is blotted, the ground is hot, the telescope is hot, everything's hot, they're all releasing these photons that are clouding your signal. How do you get better than that? Well, you cool it down, you cool everything you can down, and that drops the noise from all these other black bodies around you below the signal level of your CMB. So this is kind of the basic principle here about uh, what we need to try and do to make it easiest on us, and easy you know, relative, cooling down things is hard, but it makes it easy to um, get the CMB signal we want to go after without having to spend forever uh, staring at the sky to try and tease it out. Okay, so let's go back to these telescopes. Look at these two designs, refractive and reflective, and what I've just told you and what issues we might have. Let's first start with the refractive one because that's the obvious one where lenses become a bit of an issue again. They're transparent, but they're not 100% transparent. So not a black body, they're not absorbing all radiation, but they absorb some, and if they're absorbing some radiation, it also means they're emitting some radiation. And that means they're a noise source. So what's the solution to that? You cool them down. If you can put the whole thing in a cold environment, then you're fine. That's kind of what we do. That's, that's our first requirement here, is if we are going to build a refractive system, we need to cool the whole thing down so that the telescope itself doesn't add a bunch of photons you know, and stuff that is noise to the CMB signal we want. Okay, so that's good uh, for a refractive system. How about a reflective system? Now the mirrors themselves are reflective, and this is key. If something is very reflective, that means it's not very absorptive. So that means the amount of light they're getting into our signal, the amount of noise they're contributing is small. But there's a minor detail we gotta keep in mind, and that's this secondary mirror here cannot float in space. You have to hold on to it somehow. And so the struts that you hold on to that you see in a lot of optical telescopes are a big problem for us. You know, not least because they block some of the light, which isn't great. They cause diffraction, which is another complication you have to deal with uh, as far as scattered light. Um, but they're also warm. They also emit light into our beam that um, can cause additional noise. Fortunately, there's a really easy solution that lets us keep using reflective. And this is something, if you see any CMB system, it's almost certainly one of these, it's an off-axis system. So I'm showing an off-axis Gregorian, and it's basically like saying you had a mirror and you had a secondary mirror, and instead of centering everything along the primary axis, um, you just use a section of mirror that's off axis. And uh, same with the secondary, you just use a section of that and it forms a nice focus over here. Okay, so great. We just have a refractive system and a reflective system that we can continue to use to observe the CMB. Uh, keeping in mind, there's this nice focus here. And that gets us to our next problem. I need to take a picture of that. I can't exactly put my eyeball there and hope to see the CMB. I'm draw it, you know, on a pad. I have to have a camera of some sort. I am gonna gloss over a category of detectors that don't need to be cold uh, to take these photos. Um, I do that because while they have done some impressive measurements before, they've, they, they're much less common today. And what you see now is you see cameras that are primarily composed of some form of a bolometer. So I'm gonna introduce you to our equivalent of the CCD. You know, the revolutionary technology of the uh, some millimeter through microwave uh, part of the spectrum. 
and that is uh, a bolometer, which is bolometer. It's a heat uh, measurement. That's all it is. Uh, I'm showing a picture here. Key to point out, this is a dime. So this is a single pixel of a telescope that JPL made. Uh, and you see this little spider web pattern there. Uh, and it is, in fact, called a spider web bolometer, if you want to look it up. Uh, that is used to absorb the radiation. It's on the same scale as the, say, millimeter wavelengths that are coming in. So this is very good at absorbing millimeter wavelengths and not absorbing other wavelengths. Um, and why it's trying to absorb that radiation is because in the middle there, right, the spider that's sitting at the center of the web is, in fact, just a really, really good thermometer. And so this is this uh, resistive thermometer here. You have power coming in. Uh, this absorber absorbs it, the whole pad heats up, and by how much it heats up, we can tell how much power came in, and that's our signal, that's it. I want to know how much power I got from the CMB by looking at one patch of the sky, I just see how much it heated up. Um, so that's, a, you know, kind of the basic principle of how these works with obviously some added details. The challenge here, the really trick of it is, is that same thing with trying to find the moon at night with a hot hand. You really need to be colder than the thing you're trying to look at. The thing we're trying to look at is 3 Kelvin. That means pretty much all bolometer technologies I know of that use uh, look at millimeter wavelengths are 0.3 Kelvin or colder. So I want to repeat that, 0.3, fraction, just fractions of a degree above absolute zero. This is incredibly cold. Um, and you have to be that cold for these types of detectors to work. And again, as I've said, these are the most sensitive detectors we can make. We, we've actually maxed out on that. We cannot make a more sensitive detector. We actually use a slightly different style that uses a superconductor as, the, um, as effectively the thermometer, uh, but it's the same principle. And, um, and so that's forcing us into kind of the next regime I'm gonna talk about, which is cryogenics. How do you get things that cold? So cryogenics is a branch of physics that deals with the production effects of very low temperatures. Uh, and this is a huge amount of work that I do. In fact, it was something I was working on um, right before this because we had a, bit, a little bit of a cryogenic emergency that is <laughs> poorly timed as, uh, as, as everything these days. But um, so, you know, just to talk loosely as a definition, it's below 93 Kelvin or negative 292 Fahrenheit. Uh, as far as me and the work I do, again, I'm working with our, our detectors we use are 0.1 degree above absolute zero. So this is actually quite hot for me. Um, but you do have to get down to these temperatures. Uh, it can be used to freeze bodies. I think that's in popular culture where it seems to pop up the most. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't want to forget the villains that are born of cryogenics as well. Uh, so hoping that doesn't happen to me, but uh, at least I'd be in good company, I suppose. Um, but this is a kind of the study of how to get things cold and keep them cold. And the universe really doesn't want you to, so it is quite challenging. Okay. Um, so this gets into round three here, which is we already decided for these optics, it needed to be cryogenic. This just means that the focal plane over here needs to be 100 mL Kelvin, but it does mean that my reflective system needs to have a camera that's cold as well. Um, and so this adds a bit of a challenge to the reflective system. Now you could ask, can I cool the mirrors down? In a space-based system and other systems, they do, absolutely, it, it does help, but you don't need to. Again, the reflectivity, you, know, you take a hit, but it's not a big hit. Um, and certainly you're never gonna cool down a six meter dish. It's that's way too challenging, we don't even wanna try it. Okay, so, um, so we don't need to, we'll just get, attach a camera to it at the focus that can cool down the detectors. Okay, so now I'm gonna pop away from these very simple diagrams to some actual real telescopes. Uh, and kind of a fun history here. So on the left, we have the bicep ca camera, which has two lenses. It's still a very basic refractive system. An objective lens here, uh, and a field lens here, and the detector array here. That's cold. I think this was a 300 mil Kelvin system, 0.3 Kelvin. Uh, Couple to the sky over here. So this is a window over here. And all these layers around it, I'll get to those, but those are the cryosat. This is all the th attempts we make to keep it at that temperature, to keep this whole system very cold. And sure enough, this is uh, to date still, uh, this system and it's, uh, the evolution of this system have been some of the most sensitive CMB telescopes uh, ever made. Uh, on the right, you see another telescope that I mentioned briefly, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which is a six meter primary dish in this off axis configuration with a secondary. And sure enough, is coupled to this camera that has, uh, is a cryostat that keeps the detectors, et cetera, cold over here. 
I also wanted to mention just kind of a fun bit of history here, you know, personal connections to these. Uh, my graduate school advisor, former advisor at UPenn, he was one of the PIs, the, the principal people working on this telescope act. So uh, I have a little bit of background there. Uh, and my current advisor, Brian Keating, he actually wrote the paper. I stole this uh, figure from uh, back in the day when he was on the team. Uh, he was leading the team designing this telescope. Uh, so okay, came by it honestly, uh, as far as kind of the interest in these types of systems and how they've evolved in the last 10, 20 years. Um, okay, so this is gets to our, uh, uh, to the basic, you know, I've now shown you we've evolved, we have a refractive system that's a very sensitive CMB telescope. We have a reflective system that is a very sensitive CMB telescope. They go after slightly different science goals. Again, this is really just for inflation. This is for everything else you can do with the CMB. Um, but there's obviously some additional challenges here that we should get to. So show me the tech. How do we actually build these? How do we actually get them this cold? And for that, I want to take you into a little bit of Cryostat 101. Um, this is, you know, how do you design a camera that actually does this? So let's say you have a camera and you want it to be cold. Um, and we can go right back to our black body. This room, a sauna here, is hot. Uh, just generally, the room is hot and it wants to, you know, whatever, you know, your ice cube, your beer, whatever it is, uh, the room's gonna heat it up. So we need to prevent that from happening. Uh, the first thing we do is we try and cool it down more. You get a really expensive refrigerator and hook that up to your camera. Uh, that gets you a good chunk of the way there, but obviously that's going to be wasted effort if you're not doing everything you can to insulate it. Uh, so the next thing you do is add a whole lot of insulating layers. Um, and this is actually accurate. I think we have basically four main stages to protect the camera. Um, air is pretty conductive, so we don't want that. Get rid of that. Uh, make it a vacuum inside there. Um, and then um, you need some mechanical support to hold everything up. It can't just float there. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is a, always a detail that we hate, but uh, it's not good if you're taking a camera a picture and you're not recording the image. So you got to hook, you know, a bunch of wires to all this to a computer. That gets a little challenging. Uh, and then the worst part of all of this is we've done all this great effort to isolate our camera from the room. Uh, but what good is that if you aren't letting in the photons? So, of course, we do the weirdest thing you can do in cryogenics, which is take your nice isolated system and put a big hole in it. Um, and, of course, there's a window here to keep the vacuum and a bunch of filters. So we, we have filters that don't just define the photons we look at, but they're also there to reject all the infrared light that's trying to transfer that heat from the, you know, the black body as the room, the atmosphere, whatever else, that heat transfer uh, from the hot black body to your cold uh, camera. Um, so that's kind of the basic of it. Okay, so kind of getting back into it. Round four, let's get around to uh, our final iteration here, which is we have it, we have technology, um, we, we build a whole system around this, and what does that look like? Uh, this is the previous generation. In our generation, what that looks like is uh, the Steinitz Observatory cameras. Uh, and telescope systems. So here they are. And I've thrown a number of curveballs at you, just for fun, because we couldn't keep it simple. Um, the first thing to note is to go back to what I said before about the detectors. We've made them as good as we can. This poses a problem. If I want a telescope that is more sensitive, um, I can improve certain things like the optics and you know cooling other things down and improving it, but there's only so much I can do there uh, the only other real easy way to get better sensitivity in a fixed amount of time is more detectors. Uh, and so this has really been pushing a lot of our technology to the limits, is just how many detectors can we squeeze in? And obviously one of these cameras is very expensive, so we want to put as many detectors in a camera as possible. Uh, and so that gets to the fact that we have not one lens, not, uh, not two, but three lenses. So we have to add an extra lens to make squeeze as many detectors back here that has still had a good image quality. Uh, so that's kind of the first thing I've stuck by you for the half meter aperture, but otherwise it's very similar to the previous generations, just some different technology and cooling. Uh, and the yellow here is kind of roughly the optical path headed out and through all these filters and windows to the CMB. Now the, um, the large aperture, that this you come across the same problem. Those, those Gregorian designs I showed before are great. But the focal plane area, the area where you have good image quality is relatively small. That means I can't fit a lot of detectors there. Now, with the small aperture, if I need more detectors, I can build more of these. They're expensive, but they're not so expensive that I won't build, say, three or four, which is what Simon's Observatory is building. 
However, talking about building three or four six meter class telescopes gets really expensive really quickly. So what I prefer to do is pack as many detectors as I possibly can into one telescope. And so that's why there's a different design here. We're no longer using an off-axis Gregorian. Uh, we're actually using a design called a cross-dragone design. And it's the same idea, it's off-axis. There's no struts or anything that uh, we can worry about illuminating. Um, but it does come with a little bit of a uh, sacrifice here in that you can see here, we have a six meter primary dish and a six meter secondary dish. And with those two six meter optics, we're able to make a, uh, a focal plane area with good image quality for us that's two meters wide. That means we can put a camera there that is two meters wide. And that's the camera here. Um, just for reference, this is a door, right? This is a huge structure. That is a camera a cryogenic camera that I can walk inside without leaning over. Okay, so let's, you know, I, again, this is cool and I've been a um, part of this. Um, my focus is the small aperture, but I can't help but least hang out a little bit. Oops, uh, uh, talking about the large aperture. Uh, the issue here is some technology is that the focal area is two meters wide, but I don't have any windows that are two meters wide. I don't have any filters that are two meters wide. At that point, I've maxed out my technology and I need to think of a different solution to take advantage of that high image quality across that two meter area. So the way we do that is go, um, we actually have a lens system inside the camera. So it effectively re-images the, uh, the focal point from the primary telescope, re-images that onto a focal plane using lenses. And this is a fun term I learned during this whole process, which is catadioptric, which probably a lot of people here on here know, but that is you couldn't decide between a refractive system and you couldn't decide between a reflective system. So you threw them together and you have both mirrors and lenses in your optics. That's what a catadioptric system is. Um, so what does that actually look like? So here's the large after telescope camera, some you know coolers, the windows, that sort of thing. Uh, what you can see here is these hexagonal windows. We split up that focal plane, that good image quality, into a bunch of smaller windows that meet our technology requirements. And then you end up with something that looks a lot like the small aperture telescope. In fact, they share almost all their technology with each other once you get inside the, uh, the outer vacuum shell. Okay, so again, you have these layers to, to insulate it. And then you have uh, one, two, and three lenses to take an image on the focal plane at 100 millicolon. And so this is this huge camera, again, 2.4 meters wide. I can stand inside this with headroom, I'm six foot. It's insanely large, it's an insanely cool project. Um, and not to mention a very challenging one. Okay, um, but enough about the, the LAC camera. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology that goes into it, especially in the small aperture telescope. The first thing is expensive refrigerators. Is that's, you know, kind of where this all starts is we decided we wanted detectors at 100 millicolon. Um, you can do that some easy ways, like liquid cryogens will get down to 77 Kelvin, that LM2, that's nice. Um, liquid helium will get you down to four Kelvin. Um, that's pretty darn good, um, but not quite as cold as you want. Uh, a lot of previous telescopes use liquid cryogens because it's kind of like, uh, you don't have to deal with the technology. Somebody else deals with it and produces the liquid for you, and then you just use the liquid to cool. So that was easy for a time. But liquid helium is very expensive these days, and the technology to get down those temperatures has gotten much cheaper. So we don't do that so much anymore. What we do is use something called a pulse tube cooler, uh, which is in fact used to condense liquid helium. But uh, we use it to cool the first and second stage of our, our um, cryostats, a uh, 40 Kelvin stage about, and a four Kelvin stage. I'm not gonna go too much into how these work, other than it's a pretty neat trick of physics, um, but it, it effectively uses a column of high pressure helium gas and pulses a pressure wave through it uh, that is able to transfer heat from the cold side uh, to a heat exchanger that's at room temperature. And so it's able to use this pulsed uh, column of helium gas to transport heat away from the part you want cold and radiate it out um, at uh, room temperature, warm temperatures. So that's really cool. I guess you're down to four Kelvin, but that's still not cold enough. We need to go down to 100 mil Kelvin. How do we do that? We're really lucky that there's a now a commercial technology we can just buy to do this. It didn't used to be the case. Um, called a dilution refrigerator. And dilution refrigerators are just fantastic devices. Uh, and again, I won't get too much into the mechanism, but the, the long and short of it is a 
It uses two isotopes of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. And kind of like oil on water, they want to separate out. But due to a quantum mechanical effect, an interesting a physical effect, small amount of the helium-3 will dilute into the helium-4. And when it does so, it absorbs heat. And you can make a closed cycle fridge out of this uh, such that it's able to continuously absorb heat from the thing you're trying to keep cold. And that can actually get down to 0 0.005 Kelvin, five millikelvin above absolute zero. And we run it hotter because that's, you know, it doesn't do us much good to get our detectors down to that temperature. Um, but it's, it's just an amazing device that it, that it can do this. Okay, so that's kind of what we use. Uh, this is the small aperture telescope at UCSD. Uh, where we're installing the Lulishan refrigerator, uh, which is slightly terrifying because these cost $300,000 and you don't want to break it when you install it. Um, there it is installed. You can see it. These different rings are the different temperatures. And this one with the copper block on it is uh, me testing some devices at 0.1 Kelvin. Uh, obviously not right now. This is us getting ready for it. Uh, the pulse tube, the thing that gets us to 4 Kelvin is inside this box. Um, that's also just used to cool the whole thing. Okay. Um, I said we needed to take pictures, but you need to get them out. Custom electronics are quite uh, crazy. So I love showing this picture right now because it's recent. Uh, we only got this whole setup uh, done in March or April, and we've been testing it for the last few months now. Uh, it was our first pixel. Now it's not coupled to optics, it's, it's just a pixel in a, a copper box, but it's still huge because it lets us test our whole electronic system um, because you need to get the signal from that out at these various temperature stages. And this is all the wiring we need for our full array once we have it to bring that signal out to you know, uh, 0.1 Kelvin, 1 Kelvin, then it goes into this box up here and that brings it from 4 Kelvin out to room temperature where we have additional electronics to understand the signal. So that's a whole complicated system that's um, a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing we really need to look at is technology to block the radiation. Uh, so again, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, the outside of your camera is 300 Kelvin it will try and heat up anything on the inside. So you want to insulate it as well as you can. Um, you know, this is just kind of a basic schematic how insulation works. Uh, you have a lot of hot photons kind of go to your cold item. Uh, and the best way to get rid of that is just put a bunch of reflective layers as you can uh, to block them out. What we call that is multi-layered insulation. Very basic NAT acronym, but we do love our acronyms. So MLI is all this shiny stuff. It's just aluminized mylar, very thin layers, and we use uh, in the crest that we have 50 layers total uh, wrapped around the entire shell. So you can see the front part of the shell and the back part of the shell is wrapped all the way around uh, to keep the outside from heating up the inside. Um, but like I said, we do something stupid. We put a giant hole in our crest, <laughs> which makes things challenging. Uh, so then we call up our buddies in uh, Cardiff University in Wales. There's one place in the world that's able to make these filters that are really good at reflecting all lights um, that isn't microwave light or thereabouts. And so these are, are what we call infrared filters in that they block infrared and shorter wavelengths. Uh, they look really cool. So that's one kind of close up with the light reflecting off it. And here you can actually see looking at that same one reflecting onto the second one we use that's on this uh, part we're putting together. Okay, so now I've kind of told you it's uh, be helpful to show you a little schematic of the inside here. Here's a vacuum shell, a 40K shell, a 4K shell, working our way in with a refrigerator slotted in here to get the cool uh, cooling part right next to our focal plane array. Key to keep in mind, our camera detector array is 40 centimeters wide. You know, that's huge. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, for, well, our pixels aren't, count isn't so impressive, but it's about 20,000 detectors or so for each one of these. Uh, as I said, we have three lenses. We actually make our lenses out of silicon, single crystal silicons uh, that are 45 centimeters in diameter. They're huge. Uh, and the other thing I said, you know, like we, uh, the easiest way to get better sensitivity is cool down your optics. We went apart that, across that part early. Uh, we actually cooled this entire volume here down to one Kelvin. Again, these are extremely cold temperatures uh, to have, you know, basically a meter cube volume at one Kelvin or below. Uh, and then sitting above that is all the windows and filters, again, to block out all the stuff you don't want. Um, of course, this camera is no good in case you can't point on the sky where you need to go. Um, this gets back to the floor is lava. So here's the camera. You can see it hanging out in there. Um, all the ground is hot. It, it is releasing a whole lot of photons that we don't want getting in our window. So we try and block as much of it as we can. We actually have three layers of that. Uh, to control basically the, you can think of it, the hot photon, the infrared environment 
uh, and the illumination of our, our window or of our optics uh, around us. So the first stage is this ground shield. We have the shield that wraps around the whole telescope pointing platform. Uh, we have the second uh, layer, this uh, co-moving shield, the scoop, uh, that also blocks and then attached directly to the front of the camera is this warm four baffle that also blocks light. Uh, as I said, because uh, we can't fit all the wavelengths in one of these cameras, we built three to cover three different wavelengths. So you can think of them as like the millimeter equivalent of red, uh, green, and blue. Um, and uh, these, the pointing stage, I just point out this azimuth is rotating side by side. Elevation, this section points us up and down. And we have actually a third axis that we rotate on to help us control uh, some illumination, which is called foresight, which we actually rotate around the axis of our, our optical axis. Uh, so that's all kind of the main points of this. Um, so this was the CAD model. Obviously, we built it. And I love showing that, that it looks like the model. So that's always kind of fun. Uh, this is in the lab at UCSD uh, cooling as we right now. Uh, so right now, I actually want to go take a look at that. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen here. And this is uh, called SolidWorks. This is the design software I use extensively uh, that we all use to design uh, the telescopes. And this is um, what it looks like in our design software. You can see all these pieces, the warm core baffle, the dilution refrigerator. Um, if I zoom in here, you can see that here's all our electronics coming out, just miles and miles of coax. And if I rotate this around for you, you can see inside. And this is kind of cool because this has more detail than the images I was showing. But here you can see our optics, multiple filters here, lens one, lens two, lens three. These are additional filters here. And what's kind of fun is down here, you can actually see our detector array. You can see all the different pixels we use uh, to illuminate and get that signal out. And then on the back end, the back side of this, uh, we have all the wires leading to transport that signal to our computers. Okay, the other kind of fun thing I want to show you right now um, is this. These are live temperatures. Look at the dates. This is right now. Um, we're actually cold right now. We're doing a test as we speak at UCSD. Um, let's see here. I can zoom in and the 100 millikelvin. Oops. Um, and I can actually, that detector I showed you, well, we can look at the DR mixing chamber. You can see there's 0.1 Kelvin. It gets as low as about half a Kelvin or 0.05 Kelvin right now. Um, and here's the actual pixel. It's running a little bit hot just because of the tests we're doing right now, but you can see all these jumps that you can see here are intentional. Those are us running different thermal tests uh, to understand the uh, performance. Okay, um, and then I could switch over here, and this is just to show you the other part, 40 Kelvin and 4 Kelvin, um, and it's kind of a fun thing I can show you here. Let's see here. Let's go with um, view view, and I can view that front filter, and some of these are tests, um, but what you're actually seeing is the day-night cycle in our high bay, because uh, like many things in San Diego, we don't have air conditioning in our lab. It's just open to <laughs> the ambient temperature. So you can actually see day-night cycle. Now, this was a test, um, but you can actually see this week's heat wave in our temperature data just because we're coupled to the room and it heats our entire uh, cryogenic system up to some degree. Um, so that's kind of fun to see. All right. All right. So um, with that, you know, that's kind of where we're at now. We're we're a fully functioning camera here, and we're getting ready to go. Um, and we're in the middle of our testing and integration, and trying to get all of those different parts together, all that different technology I was talking about, to actually get a fully functioning camera, um, so we can take it down to Chile and start looking at the CMB. Uh, so at that point, I'll open it up to questions uh, from anyone and everyone, uh, and hopefully you have a few for me. Thank you. Okay, well, then I'll start off with the question. Um, do you know when you're scheduled to install the hardware in Chile? Yeah, now, well, <laughs> as with many things we say, we have a schedule. Uh, it's not looking so great right now. Um, but uh, not really we're supposed to be going out that this fall. Obviously, that hasn't happened. Um, Currently, you know, currently, to be quite honest, Chile is still in lockdown. We, we can't even get our personnel to the site and they need to lay the foundations and other things like that. We're yeah. hoping we'll be able to get to that soon. Um, but right now, to be realistic, um, 2021 would be the loose date 
<laughs> we'll get the, the first camera, the one at UCSD on the sky. So that is the first uh, camera going to Chile for the Science Observatory is the one we're working on, uh, which is a really a privilege to be able to work on that instrument, the, fir the first light instrument for Simon's Observatory. Um, I would like to say we're gonna go there spring, early summer, um, but that's you know obviously pending things picking back up again as far as the, the research goes. Uh, so we'll see, and uh, hopefully the condition in Chile continues to improve. It has been getting better, but it still has a better ways to go. Okay. Uh, anyone else have a question? A uh, question. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So um, you will be able to detect any polarizations, informations from these detectors? Yes, indeed. In fact, that was something I entirely glossed over. Um, yes, uh, these are actually polarimeters. In fact, the, the absolute temperature signal uh, is it's still interesting. There's still a lot we can do with it, but really a lot of the science and the next generation of telescopes is polarization. And that is largely um, because the satellites that were launched, um, the, the latest one, Point, did have some polarization capability, but wasn't optimized for it. The cameras I'm showing you, all of these are, are every last detail is optimized for the polarization signal. And in fact, that is the signal that will tell us um, about inflation is these really small, when I talked about a millionth of a you know, degree fluctuations in the CMB, that was polarization fluctuations. That's the polarization signal. Uh, so you, it's an incredibly astute uh, <laughs> question. It's like, yes, absolutely. Uh, these are through and through polarimeters and that's our main science. Next question. I was wondering about funding, um, knowing that COVID has delayed just about everybody's project from here in, in whatever. Is that going to affect monies that would normally be spent within a quarter or a certain time frame? Or is that already captured in what you've already manufactured in the form of your of your telescope? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so um, I think I can go, there, there's about two, two parts to this. So the first is uh, the, you know, Simons Observatory is named after a guy named Jim Simons. Uh, he's a billionaire who likes science and has done some really great uh, philanthropy. Uh, and the lucky part about that is we're, we're pretty confident that that funding will continue to come through his plan. So it hasn't actually disrupted our funding. And in fact, the Simons Foundation, which this is a run through, um, has, you know, committed to keep all of our staff funded, um, you know, and uh, paid throughout this time period. So we, we're really fortunate to not have any disruption there. Uh, but I do want to say, you know, kind of speaking beyond that, I have many colleagues who are working off of, say, government funding, NSF funded, um, some of which uh, our research is funded by. Uh, and so far, we haven't seen disruptions in that. And we have seen, obviously, big disruptions in, you know, scheduling in terms of, um, oh, you mentioned Alma. Uh, you were correct. Alma is our neighbor. They're down the road from us. They're great. Um, we like using their infrastructure. Um, as far as I understand, all their funding is still secure and, and their staff are good to go, but they've shut down the entire observatory. Pretty much any government-run observatory, observatory, well, any observatory really, uh, is shut down. I want to say that mostly. I think there's a few of the optical ones are still running for observation time. If they're, if they're already set up for mostly remote and didn't need much site work, um, then, then they might still be running. But uh, I know almost completely shut down. That's a problem for us because we actually um, built off of their infrastructure. So one thing I can tell you about is to go to our site, we need to have a medical team on, on standby effectively. Uh, traditionally, we have used almost. We have an agreement with them that says if we have a medical problem, we give them a call on a radio and they'll come and help us out because they have much better infrastructure than we do. Um, is, uh, they're in their billion dollar facility. They're amazing. Uh, got all the bells and whistles. Um, but that's doesn't exist right now. So part of us, you know, we're in a kind of a desperate place because we really need to get these foundations laid because there's only certain times a year you can actually do it. Um, so there's a lot of permissions we need to jump through, but one of them is just having medical personnel on a site, which means we need to find medical personnel to hire to go there as long as Alma is shut down. And of course, Alma can stay shut down much longer, uh, you know, than, than we can with, with minimal impact. So the long and short of that is the funding so far has continued to come through, but the, the schedule disruption and costs incurred from that schedule disruption are certainly noticeable. Uh, and that will require some uh, reassessing down the road. Uh, Dr. Nick, we have an online question in our chat. Um, 
Rick Gonzalez was asking if there are tours of your lab at UCSD. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just, just let me know. Not right now, obviously. Um, you know, we'll have to wait until this uh, disaster is over. Um, yeah. Because you know, even we have limited access to our lab right now. Uh, but I can speak to better times. To better times, um, if you uh, contacted me or somebody in my lab uh, and, and wanted to come by for a tour, we we're pretty much always happy to take a break and show you around. Um, and we've been given lots of tours to say, you know, school groups, um, research groups, um, visitors, you know, what have you. Yeah, it's, um, we, you know, well, we like doing, you know, uh, engagement events like this, but obviously lab tours are probably the easiest engagement we can do. Uh, and so we, we definitely take advantage of that uh, when we can, yeah. Uh, any questions? Next question? Go ahead, Frank. Uh, unmute yourself, Frank. Okay. How does the Earth's atmosphere affect your measurement program? Do you <laughs> calibrate that out, or how is that quantified? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Let's see here. I have a slide for that, kind of. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things in the way. Um, <laughs> so, so that's where satellites have a huge advantage uh, over us uh, in terms of things they don't have to look through. Um, you're right. Um, the Earth's atmosphere does emit, you know, some of some of that same uh, radiation. So it's actually a, a kind of bright source for us. Um, but that's not even the problem. The big problem for us um, from the atmosphere. It would be fine if it were a constant noise term. If it were just, it would just stay the same, it'd be fine. Um, and actually what affects us the most is atmospheric water vapor. So we're really sensitive to a, a mission from water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, that is why we observe in Chile. And actually we have the distinction of being the third highest observatory in the world. We're actually higher than Alma by a few hundred feet. Uh, we operate at 17,000 feet. Um, and that's entirely in a desert. And one of the highest and driest place uh, on earth that had a road to it is basically where our observatory is. Uh, it used to be a mine, so we got to take advantage of some, some access there. Um, and that, that is, yeah, just entirely to get above atmosphere because it blocks the signal, um, it adds noise to our measurement. The, but again, the worst part is not the constant noise, it's the change in noise. It's the issue that when I'm looking over here, and by the time I've scanned over here, the atmosphere on top of me is drifted. Um, and uh, the amount of signal from the atmosphere has changed. And that's a fluctuation that can kind of mask itself as you know, an actual on-sky fluctuation. Um, there are some nice things about it. It doesn't tend to be polarized. So for polarimetry measurements, there's actually some uh, easier ways to get rid of the atmosphere. Uh, there's, um, we actually, need, for the small aperture, we modulate the polarization signal. And that allows us to uh, really limit the amount those drifts hurt us um, by basically locking into the modulated signal. Um, but uh, it, it kind of comes down to on how quickly you scan. We want to scan the you know the telescope as quickly as we can, so the atmosphere changes as little as possible while we're scanning. Um, but that has technical limitations to how fast we can do that. Uh, and then, kind of what what you really asked about is you know we have a small aperture telescope and a large aperture telescope. Larger aperture telescope is actually very bad at. Um, determine signals on, on large scales, as in if you really wanted a sensitive measurement of how hot the sky is to my right and how hot it is to the left, the large aperture is not very good at that. By the time it gets from there to there, uh, the atmosphere is very too much and, um, and it doesn't have a good calibration, so it works on smaller scales. And you kind of build up from that. So we have many, many calibration techniques in order to try and mitigate that as much as possible to recover as many scales as possible and to remove that signal as much as possible. Um, but ultimately it is something we have to live with. Um, and there are better times of year and worse times of year for observing. And there's a, I think when, was it, the winter down there it tends to be humid enough that we, that's when we do all our um, maintenance. So that's one of the reasons we, we have a kind of yearly cadence for maintenance cycles. Great question though, yeah. All right, next question. Okay, well, I have a follow-up question then. Um, Nick, Dr. Nick, um, your uh, polarization is uh, capability, is that because you're looking for primordial gravity waves? Right on, so, yes. Which polarizes uh, the 
CMB in a particular circular pattern. That yeah, and I cool. usually have that as a backup slide. I don't on this deck. Um, yeah, yeah. So getting a little bit into the the polarized signal. Um, let's see here. There's two types, and this just has to do with the pattern they make on the sky. And I can kind of speak to that. Um, here, I got two flashlights. All right. Um, so if you have a radial pattern, there we go. They're kind of in line with each other. That's your polar pattern, and kind of rotating around. Um, that would be what we call an E mode. It's uh, it just has to do with kind of the mathematics of how that's uh, changing across the sky. Um, so this is to say you've gone and measured the polarization of the CMB, and the CMB is polarized. And that E mode signal, that kind of linear response, is um, uh, is entirely expected. If, if this is a natural uh, artifact of having, say, a spot in the CMB that's slightly hotter and a spot that's slightly colder and scattering off electrons between the two will reduce, produce a polarized signal that looks like that. Uh, that's well understood and we've measured it really well. What you're referring to is what we call B-mode polarization or the polarization from primordial gravity waves and it has a curl component and so let's see if I can do this. Um, it's really hard to do with just two but uh, the <laughs> idea is it actually has a handedness so that if you mirror it, it won't look the same. Yeah, it has a handedness too. It's uh, the pattern it makes on the sky. Um, and what, that what handedness, you? that kind of swirly pattern, if you look at the, the maps of it, uh, can only be produced by, well, three things. And this kind of gets back to the, uh, this gets back to the image I'm showing right now. Uh, the three things that can produce it are primordial gravity waves, which would be lovely to discover. That's what we're going after. They, they can produce this by effectively gravitational waves rippling through the early universes, distorting right. the polarized light uh, from that era. That would be cool. That's what we want to look at. Uh, but there's two other things that uh, produce it. One is what we call lensing. And this is the other really cool, powerful thing you can do with the CMB uh, in this image, right? It's um, the CMB is the backlight to the rest of the universe. This is good and bad, and good is it can tell you a lot of things about what else is going on in the universe. Uh, the bad is if you're trying to understand what happened very at the CMB, all this galaxies and galaxy clusters and all this mass between you and the CMB will actually distort the signal. It will lens it like a gravitational lens. Uh, and that can also produce that polarized signal. And that has been observed. We have observed the lens uh, B-mode signal recently. In the last, I think last five to 10 years, that's been a big discovery. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, the third thing mm -hmm. that can produce it that was um, the downfall of BICEP not too long ago, uh, their results was the galaxy. The galaxy actually has, um, and so that's why I have the Milky Way up here, is things in the way. Uh, the galaxy is really cool. It has these little dust grains that align with magnetic fields and, uh, and radiate at about 20 Kelvin. They're warmer than the CMB, but they're really bright and they're pretty well polarized, uh, the light from them, uh, and they can mimic that signal. Uh, and so that's you, you touched upon why we have such a wide frequency regime, a wide wavelength, uh, range of wavelengths we look at, that rainbow that we have to have, is because uh, things in front of us, especially the galaxy, tend to emit light that can mimic the CMB light. In order to tease apart what is emitting what, you need to look over a wider wavelength regime uh, because, say, the galaxy for that particular signal is brighter at um, shorter wavelengths at say one millimeter, whereas we look at the CMB at two millimeters. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question and touching on exactly what we do and what the SAT is designed to do and why we have that wide uh, wavelength regime to look at. And, and you've learned from the bicep uh, yeah. activity and uh, improved your hardware and your approach. That's really cool. Yeah. Another question? Uh, Nick, I have a question. Uh, Dave Decker. Um, when you have the telescope up and running, will you have to go through some kind of a process to measure the instrument response like you would with a spectrometer? Oh, yeah. No, that's actually a lot of what we're working on right now. Um, uh, a huge amount of our effort at the moment is trying to understand how to properly calibrate the device. Uh, and, and we actually have a hard time with this because uh, we don't have, there are very few microwave sources that are point sources. Now there's planets. We actually look at planets as a calibration. Um, 
But for polarization, I, I actually tell a Crab Nebula is one of the polarized sources we can look at, but it's not very good because it has extended structure. It's not really a polarized point source. So that creates a lot of challenges. Uh, so we have a number of calibration devices uh, that we try to, uh, that we're building right now to work with these telescopes to understand their response. Uh, there's some really basic ones, like we can just put a polarized grid in front of it and rotate the polarized grid and see how the polarization signal changes to calibrate the, say, the angle on our detectors. Uh, there's some simple stuff like that. We can look at the moon. We actually do scan the moon because it's a really bright source for us. And um, you can calibrate your, your detector's response based off of the moon. Uh, and also planets for point sources, that sort of thing. Um, to understand our, say, spectral response, we're, we're, uh, we're, we will have to attach a spectrometer to the front of our uh, telescope. Uh, th that allows us to basically scan through a spectral response to understand what the uh, frequency response of the, our beam is. Um, you're actually, actually, you guys are giving me the easy, the nice questions. Um, uh, coincidentally, I, I have a Fulbright scholarship to go to Chile, well, nominally next February, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Sometime in 2021, I'll be going to Chile to work with a uh, professor there who's building a, a polarized uh, source, so it's a, a microwave emitter, and he's putting it on a drone, so we can actually fly it above the telescope in our far field. Um, and so that, <laughs> it's really hard to do. Um, the South Pole telescopes do something kind of similar. They have a really tall mast uh, that, we, that they work with, um, but they're able to point lower than we can uh, because uh, the South Pole doesn't have mountains and it's colder. Uh, we have mountains and they're quite hot, so pointing low for us is, is why we have all these ground shields and uh, other protection methods which make it harder to do some of these calibration methods and that's why we're getting to more exotic things like flying drones around above it. Uh, but it should be a lot of fun and hopefully it works and that will give us um, you know, this whole suite of tests that we do periodically um, to, to understand our intensity response, our polarization response, our absolute polarization angle calibration, um, our spectral response, yeah. The whole, the whole gamut, yeah. Great question, thank you. Another question? Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. What about the frequency bandwidth or the range of wavelengths you're looking at? What information does that tell you? For spectroscopy, often that tells us a lot of things. I assume it's a lot of things you can do with that information over that wide range then? Um, let's see here. So I'm bringing up our frequency bands. Um, uh, so these are our lower frequency bands. This would be there, our red equivalent of the microwave, our mid frequency bands, this is where the CMB peaks, and then our high frequency bands. Uh, these are in gigahertz, so sorry. Um, but you can think of these as around a millimeter. These are around 10 millimeter. Um, so this is what we're looking at. I'm actually showing the atmospheric transmission, which tells you very quickly why we chose those particular bands, um, because we're kind of right at the edge of the uh, radio window before it all, all goes uh, south in the, uh, the uh, submillimeter spectrum. Um, so what, what are we doing with these bands? Um, the, we really just care about the CMB, and that's not to say there isn't galactic science we can do. There is, and it's really cool too. Um, but really the reason this is funded, the main focus of this is the CMB. And so that's where we focus most of our efforts is the 90 and 150 gigahertz bands, these middle bands. That's, and the reason why, and this gets right back to what I was talking about, is the CMB, a three Kelvin black body, if you look at it, uh, peaks uh, right at about you know, these frequencies. So that's the maximum amplitude of the CMB signal we're gonna get. Um, why we have these lower ones is for a, a understand a foreground. And this is the kind of key thing I wanna tell you is we don't really have a spectrometer you know, uh, resolution because we don't really care about the whole spectral response. We want the minimum amount of information we can get to tell us what the galaxy is doing so we can remove it from the CMB signal. In the process, we learn about the galaxy, which is a good side benefit, um, but it's not really focused on that. So these lower frequency ones are for synchrotron radiations. So this is uh, electrons spinning in magnetic fields in our galaxy produce a polarized signal at uh, radio frequencies. Uh, that can alias as a CMB signal, a CMB polarized signal. So that's why we have these lower frequency bands. And then the higher frequency ones are what I was talking about. It's spinning dust grains in our galaxy's magnetic fields, uh, also emitting polarized light. 
Uh, and that's a black body at 20 Kelvin. And so its amplitude is actually um, up here in the about uh, 1,000 you know, uh, terahertz is actually where that peaks. And so its spectrum is falling, although also quite bright. Um, so that, that basically you know, explains our full frequency range is you have the CMB ones, you have the lower synchrotron ones, and you have the higher uh, galactic dust ones. And with their powers combined, we really hope um, that will allow us to remove the galactic contribution and focus on the CMB science. Oops. Um, so, so, so it's a bit so, like a six oh, narrow band ahead. filter. Yeah, so a six, they're about, um, I think, 30% bandwidth. And they're not particularly narrow. In fact, these probably aren't really giving them justice as to how wide they are. <laughs> Trying to think if I have an actual spectral thing, but um, I, you know, I'm kind of showing this, but I, I think it takes up a little bit wider of this. And um, yeah, I wouldn't define them as narrow band, not particularly broadband either, but somewhere in the middle. Other questions? Yeah, just uh, one more. So, what is the, the uh, I'm still uh, trying to understand what is the most uh, f like um, tar uh, science target for this experiment so what we're trying to basically what is the most like important goal science goal in this project uh, <laughs> uh, de depends who you ask in the collaboration everyone's got their own uh, kind of favorite thing so mine is with the small aperture telescopes is inflation you know I, I really want to find primordial beam modes and um, I'm quite confident. Uh, we do have competitors, I should say, you know, friendly competitors, but competitors nonetheless. There's the collaboration, the bicep collaboration that continues to operate at the South Pole. So you do have these kind of two large camps in South Pole and Chile uh, that are going after a lot of the same targets. And now we're in a bit of a race. Uh, they are ahead on this race, but um, I do think if, if we build these correctly, uh, these will be the most sensitive uh, CMB telescopes in the world uh, by a notable amount. So we'll, we'll start catching up quickly. And really, um, to, to kind of describe what the small aperture telescopes are going to do, um, they are going to stare at the sky for five years. They look at 10% of the sky, and they just integrate constantly on that 10% of the sky. Uh, and that's just to drive down the sensitivity limit as, as far as we can and as quickly as we can uh, to go after that primordial B-mode signal that could be an indication of inflation. And, and uh, basically this, you know, talks about what inflation is, but it's, it's this incredibly rapid expansion of the early universe. One of the predictions of that, there are a number, but one of the observable predictions of that uh, would be this background of gravitational waves made in the early universe that would produce this uh, unique polarization pattern on the CMB. Uh, and so that's what BICEP has been going after, um, when was that, so uh, almost 10 years now or something like that. Um, and that we're, we are now going after as well. Now the limit on that, it keeps dropping down. And here's the hard thing, is if inflation isn't the right theory, or even in some, some classes of inflation, the signal could be zero. Now that's still really interesting. Every time we drive down mm -hmm. that limit farther, it basically reduces the number of options you can have for these early universe uh, physics models. So I would say the broad scientific goal I hope to contribute is to further constrain viable models, viable theories for how the universe came, uh, you know, came to be and evolved in its first fraction of a second. Um, obviously, detecting it would be a lot cooler. So we do hope there is a signal there and that's within our sensitivity limits. Um, although I should say, if it isn't, we drive it down that far, there's already another generation of experiments being designed to go another few levels in, uh, in, or in order of magnitude and, and sensitivity. Um, called CMBS-4, and there's a satellite called Lightbird that's in the works. Uh, and you might ask, well, why are we spending so much effort on this? And it really is because if we see this, it would be a clue to what happened in the first fraction of a second of the universe. That is just so incredibly cool and so fundamental about the nature of our universe and the physics of our universe that's really worth um, you know, spending considerable effort after it. Now, I say that everyone has their own science goal uh, because um, you know, the Large Aperture Telescope doesn't look at that at all. The Large Aperture Telescope doesn't look at inflation. 
it looks at fundamental physics we can uh, determine from the CMB pattern. So there's some people in our collaboration who really like neutrinos, and there's some uh, information about the neutrino mass you can discover from this. Uh, there's people in our collaboration that are really into lensing. They really want to understand how all this matter between us and the CMB distorts the CMB signal, and you can actually understand how matter is distributed around our universe from that signal. So that's a really exciting thing they look at. Uh, there's another cool effect. The backlight of the CMB can uh, scatter off of galaxy clusters, and you can actually image galaxy clusters from effectively the you know, beginning of the universe to now um, and understand galaxy cluster properties. There's people that. Um, I'm actually one of a smaller group of people in our collaboration who's also excited about big galactic science, understanding more about the, how galactic dust uh, emits and uh, couples to magnetic fields is quite interesting. There's another thing that uh, we look at that I'm excited about. Um, so I don't want to, you know, I guess coming away from this, I hope you, you, you uh, can come away that there is this like one thing we're really going after, but there's this huge science case uh, for CMB instruments uh, just as this really powerful probe of the entire universe. Okay, next question. So actually, I have one more follow-up question. Uh, sure. Um, so do you think actually like if the South Pole uh, Observatory actually like they call their instruments to the same level, they can basically be competitive to this experiment? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is getting into kind of the, um, I call it a bit of a leapfrogging back and forth between the different uh, CMB collaborations. Um, so there, so let's see, I can get into some of the, the reasons why we might be a bit more sensitive or what we've tried to do. So, um, and it is subtle things. Um, let's see here. There, oh boy, this gets into more history, but there's all these different collaborations and the various collaborations have been combining. In fact, Simon's Observatory is the combination of two of the largest CMB collaborations, an East Coast contingent that built the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, um, which, hold on, let me just grab that. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, back when Simon's Observatory started, this collaboration that built this telescope combined with this collaboration that built this telescope. Uh, this telescope class is still somebody else and almost down the road over there. Um, I say this because that's kind of what's happening in the field is it's competitive is great. And a discovery of this magnitude would need a second observation to basically back it up with completely different systematics. So in this way, Chile and Antarctica are extremely complementary. that if either one actually found this, the second observation of it, the confirmation of it would be also incredibly powerful and really necessary for the, the kind of, you know, faintness of the signal, how hard it is to absolutely observe. Um, so right now we're running a little bit behind because uh, the South Pole group, the Bicent group has more experience looking at this sort of thing. In fact, if you look at our telescope, it looks a lot like theirs because we've built off a lot of the same technologies they've developed. Um, and they're building a new array right now and they've actually started to get that on sky. They're like about a year ahead of us or so. Um, but that array, I'm just going to point to two technologies where we where we kind of push a little bit further to get better sensitivity to ultimately make ours a little bit more powerful. Uh, one is the optics. Our optics are at one Kelvin, theirs are at four. That seems like a small difference, but you know, integrated over a few years, it, it makes a difference in terms of uh, the speed at which we can get to that sensitivity. So that's one part. Uh, the other part is they actually use a simpler, well, maybe not simpler, they use the same detector technology, but um, a slightly simpler architecture in that each one of their pixels uh, detects one, um, one, one linear direction of polarization. Each of our pixels actually detects both uh, the linear directions of polarization. And so in that sense, you know, each area on our focal plane has twice as many detectors. Uh, and so that, you know, makes one of our telescopes worth about two and a bit of theirs, you know, depending on how you do the optics. Uh, they do have other advantages over us, though. They have six months of night. They don't have to deal with, like, the sun or the moon. <laughs> so it's, it's much easier for them observing-wise uh, during the Antarctic winter. Um, they, although they're now pacing, you know, age of COVID, it's worth mentioning that the Antarctic season for the next year is basically shut down. Uh, they're going to keep personnel down there to keep things running, uh, but they won't be able to deploy new instruments. So that's just kind of getting into the infrastructure in Antarctica is harder than in Chile, traditionally. Um, 
so it, it's a close competition. You know, it might be, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm taking a while to answer this question. It really comes down to if there's a, a B mode signal, if this primordial signal is there, it depends what level it is. If it's a certain level, they'll find it first. If it's a little past that, we'll find it first. Uh, but it's pretty neck and neck at the moment. And the next iteration, CMB S4, which is a Department of Energy funded experiment, uh, will actually unify almost all major CMB collaborations, including Simon's Observatory with the South Pole groups. It'll just make one giant uh, CMB collaboration and the instruments in that will, um, will kind of be pushing to the next level if the, the signal is even lower. Uh, hopefully that answered your, your question about kind of the dynamics of CMB. Uh, yeah. Right now. yeah, I appreciate it. Actually, like, yeah, it's a very good insight. So, do you think actually, like, uh, um, like uh, out of this experiment, actually, like, someone will get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> um, always chasing it. No, I think I think if we detected it and it was a confirmed detection, I think that could happen. Yeah, yeah. That that is the anticipation that it's that fundamental of a discovery. So, so well, Nick, after, well, you you win that Nobel, after you win that Nobel Prize, will you come back and do a nice presentation for us about uh, what it was like to be in Stockholm? <laughs> uh, I'll give you a presentation, but I won't be going to Stockholm. That's hired me. <laughs> our, I think our author list is something, well, I can just tell you. In Simon's Observatory Collaboration, there's 300 people. Um, so I'm, I think I'm pretty high on that author list, but it's... Um, there's some very talented individuals in there, and it's uh, so a lot of people. In the, of course, top. it's always the people who got the funding. I <laughs> have to share the prize. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, okay. if we get it, I'm sure we'll throw a party. And if parties are allowed. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about the last question? Do we have a last question out there? Yeah, I have a question. Nick, would you like to introduce your family members that are online? Because I can't believe there's too many Galitskis wandering around the world. Oh well, yeah, you uh, you told me um, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a public thing, so I invited my family. It is an yeah. age of COVID and Zoom. They're, and yeah, I'll speak up. This is Dad Galitski here. Nice going, Nick. Hey, hey, Dad. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Port Townsend, Washington. Ah, ah. I, I could, I noticed the name, and I could see that it was actually light outside wherever you were. So you had to be further north than we are. <laughs> well, I see my sister's on too, Sasha. She's up in, uh, she's up in Canada right now. So uh, yeah, yeah. managed to get a few people on. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> We have an, uh, one, Aziz, you wanted a question? Well, Walter, at, at one point in time, at least on my screen, you were directly below Nick. And well, let's just say there is a family resemblance there. Well, there you go. <laughs> go ahead. Aziz, you had a question? Yes, I do, Dr. Galitsky. I may have missed this part. You may have mentioned it already. This device, are you scanning this guy or are you just traveling with, with the earth or, and oh, if yeah. you're, if you're um, scanning, how, how much can you point? That's a, that's a great question. And yes, we scan. Um, so get back to this. So this is the, the azimuth stage. So this whole section up here, um, let me give a pointer back. This whole section up here rotates side by side. I will say this is gonna get back to the atmospheric question is we do have a weird scan pattern let me get into it because it is, I think, actually a pretty creative solution. Um, we scan at a fixed elevation. So almost, you know, unless we're going after like a calibration source, like a planet or something like that, uh, we'll be pointed at three degrees above the horizon and we'll scan back and forth. And the reason is because of the atmosphere. If we change elevation, we change uh, the column of atmosphere we're looking through. And so we'll see a big change in our signal. Uh, which we don't want. So we tend to do these fixed elevation scans where we swing side to side. Um, and the other thing is with polarization, and actually this is another advantage Chile has over Antarctica, um, is we, we scan as basically, yeah, the, 
the sky rises up through our field of view, uh, and we can get the polarization direction in one direction going up, and then we'll actually turn around 180 and look at its setting. And that's actually a way to control our polarization systematic because we uh, basically get sky rotate, we call it sky rotation, but just because of the sky moving over us rotates that polarization angle so that we can sample it in different ways and that helps us control our systematics. Uh, but yeah, that tends to be our, our uh, control. Uh, I can say on azimuth, uh, I forget what range we have, but it's like 400 degrees. So we can do, uh, we can do an owl's worth of turning, I guess. Um, let's see, elevation, we can only go as low as about 20 degrees above horizon up to 90, 20 to 90, I think is our basic our range there. You can actually see we have, um, oh God, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. It, this big pole back here is, uh, is our elevation drive. Uh, so it's a, uh, God, I'm forgetting the name of it. Anyway, uh, jack screw, maybe that's the right name. Anyway, uh, that's our elevation drive. And then the weird one we do is, again, to understand polarization systematics, you know, basically to better calibrate uh, how the polarization signal changes is we rotate the whole camera uh, so that we directly induce a polarization change. And so what we would do is we scan a section of sky, pause, rotate the camera, and then go back to scanning that section of sky. Uh, so we don't do that as often because it's a little disruptive. Uh, but that boresight actually did leave it in here. Uh, it's a little bit of a technical detail, but we can rotate the whole camera plus or 90 degrees uh, around the optical axis for the, that control. Yeah, great questions. Thank you very much. Okay, last, last question. <laughs> Doctor, this told up really well. I'm really kind of impressed you can talk. <laughs> That you know, answer that many questions. Okay, I think that's it for tonight. I want to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Nick. Everyone, uh, give him a little hand, round of applause and thumbs up for a great presentation. Thank you very, great. very Thanks much. Thanks for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. You know, you guys always give me some tough questions, so I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. All right.